<laughs> now it's time to flip that coin. I have a nightmare. Let's talk about that. Now it's time to look in the mirror if you're the black community, okay? So we know Martin Luther King had a dream, but not everything is positive about any community, especially the black community. Let's talk about this. So did some more research on it and talking about how the black community in part is suffering um, in, in terms of what we're compared to in the national standards. And one of the expressions, uh, one of the places that they went to was the wealth gap, okay? That's another one that we're dealing with. So want to show those two screenshots uh, just to give you some highlights and then talk through it. So black adults name violence as the most negative attribute of the black community, the violence that ensues within its borders and spreads around the country, around the world. Uh, economic issues and housing were the other two in the top three in the community. We're going to break this down. So uh, they were asked the open ended question and obviously 17 percent said violence was number one. And that can include more than just drug activity, shootings, theft, uh, physical harm, et cetera, fights, everything, you name it. That's what they listed. And then it went to more of the economic issues such as homelessness, poverty, uh, taxes, et cetera, as most important. Now, let's talk about that violence. Let's talk about that crime. When we hear the statistics, and I think a lot of people hear it, of 52% of the murders committed in this country are committed by black people, which only represents 12% now, 13% of the country. And that's including the men and women when we know the men are more prevalent to commit those type of crimes, which breaks it down to now 8 7%, 52% of the crimes in this country committed by, let's say, 7% of the people, black males and a few black females. Hmm. All right. The crime. If you ask me growing up, the toughest thing about being black was the fact that it felt more violent. Um, I had to navigate, as I say, around a lot more landmines than it seemed that others did. Right. My daily commute, my, my daily walk, my daily bus rides were always filled with me thinking of, I got to avoid that. I got to avoid him. I got to avoid this. I got to avoid wearing this. I got to avoid going there. I can't go to that game, etc. Right. And if you're black, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not black, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, I couldn't wear certain hats. First time I ever got jacked, somebody put a gun to me told me to take off my hat. It was a Boston Red Sox hat. Now, I'm in the eighth grade. I'm a kid that shouldn't know that he, sh I, I'm a kid that should be allowed to wear a Boston Red Sox hat. Let's start there. Because sometimes you get so, so desensitized, you forget where you should even start. My son could wear a Boston Red Sox hat now, different generation and also different surroundings. But I didn't even think like that. When my uncle bought me the hat, immediately, immediately I looked at it like, I ain't wearing that hat. And I didn't wear that hat for like months. I did not wear that hat. Then I thought I was cool. Thought I was in the clear going to summer school one day. I was like, nobody really on the bus going to summer school. And if they are, ain't none of them tripping, right? And I had to go through Inglewood anyway. So I was like, the B is going to be fine. Big red B on a hat, right? That looks really dark blue, black. I was like, I'm fine. Wasn't fine. On the way back, gun to me. Take that hat off. Long story short, took the hat off, obviously. Didn't get shot either. But that was the first time that somebody directed violence to that magnitude directly at me. You add up a few more times. Uh, the time they shot up my football field when I was up there doing warm-ups and jumping jacks with everybody else. Uh, you add up all the times where teammates got killed. I have several teammates that I've lost over the years, shot, killed. Uh, you add up the times where I've been in the house and gangsters that run into the house, uh, family members of other family and friends, my family uh, from fights one time from a shooting, uh, etc. So I only bring that up because we all had to navigate to some degree around that. All of us is affected to some degree because it's a crime, right? And 
I was my number one issue. I was like, damn, what is going on? My, my mindset, my solution, the way I dealt with it was simple. I, I used to say, because it's so difficult. So many people here have jobs, not careers. So many people are living on life's edge. So many people just living check to check. I was on welfare. So many of us broke that we living on that edge and anything will set us off. Those who are dealing with those circumstances. So I agree with the study. I agree with the people who are saying crime was the most disappointing, most negative part about being in the black community, about being black, because then you're deemed a criminal more so than not. Right. You're deemed or more inclined in people's perception to be a criminal. Why? Because everyone looks at it in perception and reality of all the crime in the community. Beyond that, it was the wealth and the wealth gap has not changed. Uh, man, typical white household has about six times as much wealth as a typical black household. How about this? Five times as much as a typical Hispanic household. Yeah, I just said it. See the screenshot, you guys see it. Now, I was growing up, whether, I don't know, I didn't do the studies growing up, but I thought that black people had more money than Hispanic people. Passed us up. Either passed us up or was already beating us. And you know, the jokes in the black community were all, you know, it's 10, to, 10 of them to a house and they all living together and they all, we didn't see it, pooling their money together. But the joke was on the Hispanic growing up for us. That flipped. Because now if you look at the wealth gap at the bottom of all the races, ethnicities, it's black people. Yep. And at the top, it's not white people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's Asian Americans, you know, et cetera. Wild. Growing up on food stamps, growing up on welfare, uh, I, I, I wasn't ashamed of the money I was getting. I was only ashamed when I was around people and I had to use that money. I wasn't ashamed when I bought stuff. I was like, yo, mommy, we go to the store and there's no, none of my uh, friends here. No one I know. I wasn't ashamed around anybody else but my, my peer group, right? Like eighth grade and somebody looking at you like, oh, that's how you get it. And the craziest thing was they were on welfare, a lot of them, too. I was like, why am I ashamed of having the funny money, we used to call it, and they got it as well. Uh, but it didn't deeply hurt me or depress me. I was like, we just ain't got enough money. Government helping us out. Never thought of the grander effects. Uh, but it beat up my community. It beat up my family. I can keep going on this, but the thing to me that was most damaging outside of the crime, outside of the wealth, wasn't the gangs, wasn't the drugs, wasn't even that poverty. It was the low ambition. I think that's what really started to suffocate a lot of my community. Not all, a lot of my community, because obviously not all, because I'm sitting here as a living example with many others. But I remember seeing that and I was like, man, people are just aiming low because it's been beaten out of them to aim so high. And look, it's defeating. You go home, I, this is why Project Transition, my foundation, I do the work the way I do the work. It's because I know I could plant a seed in any kid. And that kid's gonna run around as soon as they leave that's the ceremony. You can see it. I've had kids swarming me before, walking out, signing up for the program left and right. All these kids. When you grab a kid and you talk to them on that energy level where they can accomplish anything, you're inspiring them, they feel engaged, oh, they are ready. But here's the thing. Here's the process. If that kid has to go to an underserved community. First things first, he has to go tell his friends. Some of his friends going to beat up that, that dream. Some of his friends going to step on those seeds. Then if he goes to an environment that where the mom, dad, whoever's in the house steps on those seeds as well, who's there to protect them? He's trying. He's trying to protect them, let them blossom, cultivate them. But they get stepped on. And then they get defeated. Next thing you know, if you're not being raised at home properly, the streets will do it just <laughs> automatically. And that's how the game goes. So I saw a lot of people get beat up in the community because their, their seeds were being stepped on. Simple as that. Not, it's not too deep either. It's like a kid full of ambition. Then all of a sudden, mama and daddy or the situation at home, not properly structured. This is in general. Okay. Now he's inclined to look elsewhere to be raised. And that could be the homies. And then that turned into the streets. And that turned into some strangers who become the homies. And next thing you know, that vicious cycle starts. And it continues. 
and that's how the game goes. So then I, I posed this to my, my team. I said, what do you guys think the worst thing is about being black or being uh, the black community? And they said, oppression. And I was like, oppression? I was like, whoa, that's strong. And they were like, it's the can't, cannot mentality. I was like, oh, I get you. Yeah, that's something that is in the black community, pervasive to a degree in, cer in terms of whether it used to be the man, like growing up, it was always the man, the man. I was like, now it's systemic racism, which is just the synonym of the man. But basically, there are some people who, in acknowledgement of that, will say that is going to stop them. Not that it's a part of the equation, not that it exists. No, it's going to stop them. Like, you always going to be an N-word. And I'm like, damn, that's true. People do go there. I don't. I don't subscribe to that because I just believe, look, I'm God's son. So guess what? I'm going to be able to do whatever. God's in me. I'm going to be able to do whatever. I'm greater than my greatest excuse. I'm greater than my circumstance. But people want to argue me that. Okay. Um, they also said the overuse of drugs in our communities. Yeah. I mean, look, who didn't see Snowfall and how that story went from somebody who was struggling, got into the dope game, became the kingpin, and then all of a sudden became the guy you see down the street at the liquor store. And that, you know, it explains so many people when you walk into the community, you're like, yo, what happened to him? Or, you know, and then you talk to him, dog was all sitting at running back, had a college offer, whatever, maybe got somebody pregnant, had to work, et cetera. You know how the game goes? So the drugs become the medicine to, to survive the day, becomes the gloss, becomes the lipstick on that pig that everybody wrestling with, right? Uh, somebody else said the disrespect on my team is, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's the flip almost of the outward personality, like black people could disrespect each other real fast, real tough, right? And we will hide behind the fact that, oh man, we, this is us, on, every community does this. You know, white people do that to white people, black people do that to black people. It ain't just a black thing, but my team was saying it, and I agree. Um, quick to go to 100, go to 100 real quick, the disrespect. You know, sometimes it's in the culture, it's in the rap, it's in the entertainment, whatever it may be. Uh, but the point is the disrespect can happen real fast. Uh, a lot of people still walking around feeling discriminated against the oppression mindset. They also said as well, financially unsound. Yeah, we're going to talk about that next. But basically, um, look, we're in last place financially. What did Bill Parcells say? You are what your record says you are. Yeah. And... I we got passed up. We got passed up by groups. Um, a disadvantage in many spaces and places. And I hear that. You know, like, the disadvantage is not you and your attributes, you and your talents. It's the reception of those. There are some people that are still closed-minded, right? Obviously. Some people are like, nah, I don't even want to deal with that. That comes from the black community. That's real out there. Uh, police brutality because of our color. And that was met with some pushback. But let's talk through it. Um, there's one side of it that the police brutality is just because you're black. Hey, you're more inclined to think somebody who's black is a criminal because of the criminal statistics, right? So, all right. It's that simple. It's almost that lazy to a degree. But then the pushback was a lot of times because black people feel like they're being unfairly picked on when they're pulled over, etc., that they're already in a disposition that is not cooperative. And a lot of times you see these police brutality, shootings, etc. cetera, it, it, it starts with a black person when it happens. It starts with resistance. It starts with not cooperating fully. It starts with not 10 and two, radio down, uh, window down, yes sir, no sir. Like most of them, they don't start that way. That's how I was taught by my dad. My dad said, look, you're gonna have your day in court, but you ain't gonna have your day on the concrete. So basically that meant do not try to make this situation, get adjudicated, get done. Get, we're not going to uh, legislate this on this concrete. I am not going to be sitting in my car yelling back at the police officer. That guy, as they say in sports and sports media, he has the microphone. He has the gun. He has the power. He has the badge. Respectfully, we're going to get in and out of this situation. And I've never had any problems except one time, one police officer who was actually black, came in way spicy. Outside of that, all the times I've ever been pulled over, questioned. Look, one time, mistaken identity, 
they pull shotguns out on me at, at a bus stop. I'm in the ninth, tenth grade. Pull out shotguns. Mistake. I, I, it was a Bank of America that was right around the corner. My neighbor used to work there. Always coming home to my day robbing at the bank. One time, police go by me. Woo. Whatever. I'm listening to my walk, man. Next thing I know, he pulls up again. They pull up from the side and ch- ch- get down. Yeah. When you hear ch- ch- get down, you sneeze. It could be over. I didn't say a word, didn't do anything. It felt like five minutes, it felt like five lifetimes. Uh, they say, sorry, uh, mistaken identity. I actually heard it over the CB, like suspect scene or something like that. And they were like, oh, oh, I had on a hoodie. And I guess the guy obviously had on a hoodie or whatever, and they moved on. But if I were uncooperative, I don't know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So that was met with some uh, conversation, the disadvantage and the p- police brutality because of our color. So I'm going to ask you guys, because um, I, could, I could talk about this one all day, but this is about us engaging in conversation. You agree with the study and my and my team's assessments of the black community and what else would you add as negative attributes or tell me some stories of the negative attributes as you did with the positive attributes for the black community let's talk about it and what do you hate the most about the black community and what do you hate the most about being black let's be real about this hey y'all got, yeah, we can fight it out in the comments let's talk about it because all of our experience is our expertise now